Hi, this is Bobby Ryan of the Detroit Red Wings, and you are listening to Empty Betters with Nick, Mack, and Harrison. Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to episode 73 of Empty Betters. I'm your host, Harrison Schultz. I'm going to toss it across the screen to my co-host, Nick Manella. How we doing, buddy? I'm okay. I'm not going to lie here, boys. I have I have been better. Uh, you remember the, the lovely story I shared last week about my car uh, woes? Uh-oh. Yeah, well, I tried again this weekend uh, to to bring my my new toy home, and let's just say I'm 0 for 2. Uh, I did happily make it twice as far as I did last time. Last time I went about you know 20 minutes. This time it was a whole 45 minutes. So, wow. Yeah, if I just keep this up for like another six weeks, I'll you know be bankrupt, but I'll have it here. So, yeah, uh, that's quite, yeah, quite an improvement. Yeah, it was a it was a rough day. Uh, you know, one of those classic. You hear a, a pop and a bang, and then you you pull over to the side of the road, pop your hood, and it just looks like a. It just looks like someone turned on a fog machine for my engine. It was just you know steam and and liquid everywhere. So, so Jesus. lovely to be stuck on the side of the Jersey Turnpike for four and a half hours. You oh gotta love that. And you know what I learned about Jersey that just cements this as the worst state to ever exist ever is not being able to make left turns is stupid enough in my book. You know how like, you know, in Jersey, you have yeah. to do like a stupid clover leaf turn. Anyways, the turnpike is a like restricted roadway. So to get a tow truck off of the turnpike, you have to call the state police and set it up through a specific oh and special <laughs> licensed tow company that will tow you to the first exit and then leave you there. And then you have to call another one to take your car to the body shop. Oh my God. So, so you had a hell of a day, two tow trucks and, and like two and a half hour Uber ride back to Maryland. Oh that, my God. You know, had like three digits on it was just not, not so a how, day. this is my only question. How are you getting out to New York to get the car? So this time we had had her, uh, my girlfriend's brother's car from the last incident. Right. And her parents were near, they're like 15 minutes away from the shop that it was in in New York. They were going to Jersey to visit a a family member. They were like, let's meet halfway on the turnpike. We'll get off at a a rest stop and we'll swap cars. Um, So they drove it actually, you know, like about two hours from New York onto the turnpike and got it into Jersey. It was overheating a little bit um, here and there, but you know, Hey, it's a long trip. Hey, it's an old yeah. car, you know? And then we did the swap and then I got 40 minutes in it and just, yeah. Fuck. God bless you. Yeah. That's all so, I got to say. Yeah. And I'm going to toss it over to our other co-host, Mac Vogel. You know something about long drives. I do. Yeah. I just, uh, just got done with my cross country move. So it feels really good to finally be where I'm supposed to be at not living out of a suitcase anymore. As you can see, I'm not totally set up just yet. Don't have all my, you know, wall decor up, but um, I'm pretty much unpacked for the most part. So that part feels good. Um, Got here on a Friday, which is a great, great day to get into uh, Milwaukee and drink all weekend and see friends. And yeah, it's been a good time so far. Uh, It's kind of hard to believe that I've only been here for like four days because it like didn't, didn't skip a beat. Just, just started hanging out with my buddies and everything. So that's awesome. Yeah. What's the weather looking like? Oh, that's the worst part. That's the worst part. I a little little different. (laughs) I really thought that I had timed it so that I would like, I missed the whole winter. I was being so naive. It like the first night it got into like the like high twenties. It was like 27 degrees. And I was like, so angry. Uh, Today it's (laughs) nice out, which means that it's like 58 okay nice um nice. and the sun is out so that's getting there something nice, but nice little 80 degree day here down in baltimore can't complain. i know i heard yeah yep. that sounds good life is good so all righty well uh now that we've caught up on uh nick's car breaking down for the second time can't wait to hear what next week episodes hold uh i'm gonna toss it off to him to drive the bus right now nice because that that'll drive my car won't yeah, um, exactly yeah 
My at this point, that car should just be like a bus for the coast because it breaks down enough anyway. So <laughs> the, the guys oh, in the coast. I forgot um, to announce interview. Oh yeah. Yeah, so we were uh, we were lucky enough to be joined by South Carolina Stingray Tarek Hammond. Uh, he joined us yesterday. We're recording this on April 27th. He joined us yesterday on Monday night, uh, sat down, talked about his career. Um, he won a national championship at the University of Denver in 2017, played with some awesome guys like Troy Terry, Will Butcher, um, coached by Jim Montgomery. So a lot of good stories. Uh, and we were very thankful for his time and uh, we look to have him back on in the future. So yeah, definitely. We, awesome interview. You'll uh, you'll find that in the middle of the episode. But uh, for right now, there's a lot of league news to get to some very exciting stuff. Sit back, relax. I'm going to toss it off to Nick now. Yeah, bunch to get to. Um, you know, a bunch of teams have clinched playoff spots. A bunch of teams are mathematically eliminated. But uh, the biggest thing to start is got to be the second half of the NHL TV rights being picked up. So Turner sports is going to be the partner alongside ESPN that covers the NHL uh, broadcast schedule. This means that NBC is done with the NHL TV deal completely. They're out of it. So Turner owns TNT and TBS. Yes. And I think the big thing here is it's great to have those two, but the fact that they're going to be streaming games on HBO Max is, I think, Huge. incredible. Because, you know, if we can get off topic for a second, I think that's probably my favorite streaming service that's out there now. You know, of course, now that everyone has one, but I think mm-hmm. they do a good job. And I think if people who, you know, maybe aren't as big of a hockey fan or, you know, just scrolling through there one day and see that, you know, a hockey game is on, they might turn it on. Yeah, I'm also super pumped about the potential uh, personnel that we can get on NHL broadcast. I mean, Charles Barkley, outspoken <laughs> hockey fan, also works for TNT. He does. I mean, there's a lot of uh, a lot of big names that we could potentially get. It would seem that the NHL has pretty much mimicked the NBA's TV pattern. I mean, they have the same stations now. So yeah, I, this is great. I'm I'm pumped. Um, you know, I, I like the guys on NBC. We've all kind of grown to know and love them, but. Let's just be honest. That intermission report's fucking horrible. It's it is. It's time it's for a, it's, it's time boring. for a reboot. Like as much as I like staring at Patrick Sharp, you know, it's like he is cookie cutter. Like get pucks deep, shoot the puck, and for you know sure. you got Keith Jones re- reiterating the same stuff, and it, it's just you know. I think it's time for a change. I think those guys are burnt out too. Like I think they've just all kind of hit a wall doing this at this point. Yeah. It, it's a good broadcast team. I do hope they keep some guys. Like Edzo's still great. I think Edzo definitely one hundred percent. Yeah, has a spot. Um, so you know, there's some guys that I think will stay. But I am pumped for some new members, and I hope Butchie Gross is on the broadcast team for ESPN because I, like I said, you would um, think he would be. I think I would just assume the big ESPN ticket is going to be him and Melrose. Yeah, I'll tell you one other guy that I really liked. Um, NHL Network announcer on the weekends. He does the Saturday day games that are on NHL Network. Steven Nelson. He's awesome. Him and Weeksy did a great job uh, at, on the Penns Devils game last Saturday. So I would like to see him in the lineup, uh, the broadcast lineup too. He's got that Butchie Gross energy, like yeah, you know, big save, and you kind of feel that that energy. Yeah. So um, great stuff. Yeah, definitely. So uh, ESPN will obviously be their their primary partner for next season. It's a seven year deal. So that's good. It's got some longevity to it. Uh, Turner is going to get half of the postseason games on a TNT and TBS sort of like split. Uh, they're going to get three of the next seven cup finals. So that'll either be on TNT or TBS, which I don't hate. Um, I think they exclusively get the winter classic. Um I don't know if ESPN will get that. I think it's just TNT, TBS. So, yeah, um, I think that's a great, you know, ticket for them. It, of course, a ton of money was involved, but I think this is a huge step in the right direction for the league. 100%. I, I, I am really excited. I, I'm Next season is going to be a good one. I can yeah. feel it. Speaking of next season, uh, the NHL <laughs> hopes to begin the 2021-2022 campaign on October 12th. Uh, that would be about a week later than the start of a typical, you know, season that starts in October. Uh, the date is contingent on no further delays uh, in this current campaign. So obviously we had the delay with the Canucks basically having to have the playoff start date pushed back like two weeks because of their COVID problems. But 
So as long as that doesn't happen again, we could realistically be looking at going back to, you know, what the normal NHL schedule looks like and training camps would reportedly open up on September 22nd. So uh, please let this work and let's just get us back to our normal schedule. So it's good to hear. It's good to think about. Feels, feels like that'd be awesome if we could just kind of get back to that normal thing. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm excited to be having hockey going on, you know, in July or June or whatever it's going to be this year, but definitely getting back to normal is a goal and hopefully that's uh, on track to actually happen. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Jonathan Taves, who has missed this entire season with an illness, uh, not COVID related. It was a separate undisclosed illness uh, at the beginning of the season, is not expected to return this season, but has repeatedly stated that he is expected to be available for the Blackhawks next season. So hoping that he, you know, recovers and is feeling better and, you know, gets back into that lineup because I think they could definitely use him. Uh, So that's good to hear. That's great news. I feel like for a little while, everyone was kind of concerned. Like, is this going to be, are we just never going to see him again? Like, yeah. is this going to kind of fade into retirement? But mm-hmm. great to see he's going to come back. I also feel like they they timely, like they timed this announcement with kind of figuring out that the Blackhawks are not going to make the playoffs this yeah. season. So that like, even if Taves might be able to go in like June or something like that, it won't matter at that point. So yeah, good point. Uh, Jacob Vrana. So I think everyone can sort of just like relax after that, you know, that trade now Red Wings fans are happy. Caps fans are happy. They both have made big splashes. Verona lit up the stars last Thursday with four goals as the wings stormed to a seven, three win. Of course, the stars, we've talked about this, you know, one day they're great and they're winning two and, you know, they're winning two or three in a row. And then they're just absolutely blowing games to the wings like this. So, um, Good to see Vrana fitting in well. Uh, clearly has his legs under him and clearly has his shot still. So I'm, I'm happy for the guy. I, I don't have a, a bad thing to say about it. I'm happy too. I think the only thing I would add is that, uh, you know, for all those people that are using that four goal performance as bait to further that, that narrative of, oh, the Caps got fleeced in this trade or whatever. What I would say to that is that Jacob Rana is not about the hat. He was not going to have a game like this with the Caps this season. It's not like, oh, wow, we traded him and look, look what he could have been doing for us. It's not that at all. I think this is an example of a guy that got traded out of a system that wasn't working for him. And now he's finally in a spot where he can shine a little bit. And like Nick said, we're happy for him. So I'll leave also it like he scores four goals in one game. That's great, but it is one game. Yeah. Mantha scores five over five games. Right. You know, yeah. which which would you rather have? And of course there's people still mad, and that's kind of the purpose of just what Mac just said, kind of putting this out there. Like, yeah, he had four goals, but it won seven three. I'd rather have five goals in five different games. Than, yeah, exactly. Than four goals in a, in a double Blow puck line cover. You didn't really need <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's, it's still a, a win. It's still two points. So <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Uh, Big Z, Zidane Chara became the fifth defenseman in NHL history to reach the 1600 game mark. He joins Ray Bork, Larry Murphy, Scott Stevens, and Chris Chelios. All pretty good at hockey, I would say. Uh, so huge congrats to Z. I feel like a lot of people didn't realize he was that high up on the games played list, but 1600 games is just. I think I asked you guys this last episode. Insane. Or maybe it was two episodes ago, and I and we were Mac, talking about Marlow, yeah, yeah. And Mac was like, "No, nah, I think Z's up there. It's just he's not like top five yet." And I think uh, now he is. Well, now he is. So, yeah. um, you know, how, for how defensemen at least, right? Yeah. Well, what was Marlow's all time record? Seventeen something. Yeah. So he's a couple hundred games behind. We'll see. I don't, yeah. I don't know how much longer Z goes, but he's in pretty good shape, I'd say. If he's the league's oldest player at forty. Four, I believe. You ever seen his workout videos? Insane. He's nuts. He's crazy. I feel yeah. like he could probably play. He's vegan two. too. A lot of people don't know that, but the man is vegan. Is he actually? Yeah, yep. he's got an insanely healthy, strict vegan diet. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, the Colorado Avalanche, Vegas Golden Knights, Minnesota Wild, and Carolina Hurricanes have officially clinched berths in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Uh, the Carolina Hurricanes clinched last night following an overtime loss to the Dallas Stars. Uh, the Blue Jackets, Sabres, and Devils have all been mathematically eliminated at this point. I think we all sort of knew, you know, Vegas was going to be the first one to clinch this. They're on fire right now. Colorado was going to be shortly behind. And then kudos to Minnesota. I mean, they've 
they've put the work in this year. So you, you've got to be happy for the wild. Yeah. And uh, Carolina clenches in an overtime loss last night with 69 points on the season. Nice. nice. <laughs> Um, uh, I don't know. I don't really have much to say. It's kind of crazy that the Wilds are the third team to clinch. I would have never, ever in my wildest dreams guessed that at the start of the it's year. It's like it, that, and that's what that was my reaction as well. And then you look at how the division, you know, just sort of shape shaped out, and you're like, okay, this makes sense. Makes sense. It's just some big, big disappointments in there, uh, in my opinion. I mean, St. Louis has not been nearly as good as I think we all thought. I thought San Jose was going to bounce back this season and they yeah. didn't. And Arizona is just so up and down. I don't really know what to make of them. I feel like I can't even give them an up anymore. They're just, they're like slowly going down. And We're going just... to talk about the Yotes later. I, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the Avs, their star right winger, Miko Rantanen, was added to the NHL's COVID-19 protocol absence list last Tuesday. Rantanen joins goaltender Philip Grubauer and winger Jonas Donskoy on that list. He has played in all 43 games for Colorado, and his 26 goals are second in the league following Austin Matthews. I feel like a lot of people didn't know that, so hopefully he gets back for the Avs quickly, or else that could be a big loss for them. Uh, Andrew Shaw announced his retirement on Monday morning. He was a key role player in the Blackhawks 2010, you know, cup dynasty, basically winning it, you know, what was it? Three cups in six years or something like that. Yeah. He won two of them. Yeah. And, uh, obviously has had some concussion problems and that's ultimately why he's retiring. So it sucks to, you know, see a guy have to retire, especially with injuries like that, but, uh, just wanted to wish him the best and, you know, hats off for a stellar career. I mean, he, he played hockey a a certain specific way, pissed a lot of people off and scored some gritty goals, but some big goals and got rewarded. I was going to say, I mean, he's just a perfect example of a guy that nobody wants to play against, but everybody would take him on their team. Um, I saw one of the like first responses to his tweet about retiring was from uh, Andrew Ferentz. And he was like, yeah, man, like wish you best, wish you the best in retirement. I never did like plan against you. And I feel like that's a good compliment I can give you right now. So just goes to show he was definitely a pesky one. Yeah. 29 years old, played the game hard nose the right way, in my opinion. Um, Exactly what Max said. One of the guys that you would definitely want on your team. So best of luck to him in retirement. Yeah, for sure. Uh, speaking of retirement, David Backus is contemplating retirement from the league after this season with the Ducks. He's got four points in 14 games and turns 37 on May 1st. In an interview, he said that it's more like a probability at this point than a possibility that he'll retire at the end of the season, but it's all up in the air. I think it's safe to expect that he will retire at the end of the season. Yeah, and I mean, if I played one season for the Ducks at any age, I'd also be <laughs> thinking about retiring too. It's only natural. It's just to play for an organization like Anaheim and then just kind of lose all your love for the game, you know? So Yeah, that's a good point because, uh, yeah, he's probably sitting there going, like, why would I even continue risk getting hurt more to uh, like keep doing this? I feel really bad for him. I, he's just one of those guys that y- you always want to root for. He's an American guy. He son of a bitch to play against big body plays hard kind of that old school game and you can't help but think you know all those all those battles that the blues and blackhawks had in the early 2010s were just awesome i think him and taves got in a fight which was you know just rock star shit and then he gets to boston and loses to his former team in the in the finals that Mm -hmm. he was captain for for so many years that that kind of breaks your heart so for sure uh, definitely one of the guys that you wish could have could have raised it before it was all said yes. and done, but hell of a career. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I've always loved him. I think he's such a gamer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He was great for the the US Olympic team in 2010. Yeah. Yeah. He's de- he's also been on multiple uh multiple US Olympic teams, so he will be missed. Yeah. Sidney Crosby now ranks third all time in points per game seasons behind only Gordie Howe and Wayne Gretzky. Not that bad. Uh, 16 seasons for Sid and 19 for Gretz. Sitz is the only one other than Gretz to do it for 16 in a row. So that's pretty impressive. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a hell of a fucking stat. Yeah. Um, I guess we'll see. There's another guy in the league who looks like he's going to be doing something similar to this. So I guess we'll see how those that shapes out years yeah. down the road. I think that's a a pretty safe assumption. 
Uh, former UMass Minutemen and national champion Zach Jones made his NHL debut for the Rangers this past week against the Flyers. He also recorded his first NHL point on Sunday night against the Sabres. So we wanted to wish him a big congratulations. Uh, that was awesome to see. I caught a lot of his first uh, his first game, so that was awesome. Yeah, good for him. Lost the first game, lost me money, but that's okay. Yeah, we won't get uh, into that. And then to wrap up the news, we have a good guy of the week alert. Jason Spezza is helping to ensure that the Toronto Marlies players get paid this season. So the Marlies are the AHL affiliate of the Leafs, for those that didn't know. And apparently Spezza led an initiative in which a group of Leafs players pulled together money to make a contribution to their AHL counterparts, who obviously had their season completely fucked up. So, of course, their contract situations are completely fucked up. That's so awesome. I love that. Yeah. That's so, so awesome. Yeah. It's probably like four guys in the team that take up all the money. So, yeah. Yeah. It's literally just go to Matthews, Marner, Nylander, and Tavares. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. That's that's really what I was aiming at. Right. There's only, what, like 85 million between those four right there. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely absurd. Uh, just some injuries to get to real quick. Uh, Tyler Bertuzzi is out for the rest of the season for the Red Wings uh, with an upper body injury. He may need surgery, according to the Wings coach. Uh, also Red Wing Dylan Larkin will miss the remainder of the season with a lower body injury. Um, Ovi will not play tonight against the Islanders, but coach Peter Laviolette said Ovi's injury is nothing long-term. I don't think anyone needs to worry about this going into the playoffs. That is a quote from the coach. Uh, so just keep your eye on that. Ducks forward Jakob Silverberg will be sidelined for four to six months after undergoing surgery to a repair a torn labrum and a bone problem Oof. in his right hip. That just sounds like it is the worst thing to try and don't fuck with the labrums. That's just yeah. Brutal. Just like rehab. And like, you know, every time you have to stand up, sit down, lay down, you know, I, I imagine it's not that easy to sleep on. So that sucks. Uh, Shane Goss's bear is out seven to 10 days for the flyers with a knee injury. So keep an eye on that. If you're a flyers fan and Nick Ehlers is done for the rest of the regular season, with an injury for the Jets, although the team does hope that he could be ready for the playoffs. Uh, so keep your, uh, keep your eyes on that, especially you fantasy guys this week. And then Zach Cassian is week to week with a lower body injury for the Oilers. Uh, probably no probably a couple that we missed, but there's been, I feel like there's been literally 14 injuries a day. So if we missed yeah. any uh, apologies, but that Ehlers one is definitely, Oh, Noah Hannafin is out for the year too. But okay. Way. I just remember that one. That's a Eel big one. Yeah, well, the Flames are kind of dead anyway. Yeah. Um, especially with that big Habs win last night. First time I bet the Habs all year. That felt good to get the dub. Uh, but that Ehlers injury is uh, that's that's big. The Jets yeah. need him. So. And he's been stepping up a lot. I think he's really yeah, stepped up. He's his had a game. really good year. And they uh, they're in a tight race with uh, with Edmonton right right now. Like yeah. they're like a point separating the two, and they just played last night too or whatever. So that's uh, definitely going to be an interesting close out to the season between those two teams. Yep, definitely. Uh, just one signing to get to Ryan Hartman reups with the Wild on a three year five point one million dollar contract. Seems like a good deal for him. Good deal for the team. You know, nice little bridge deal. So uh, glad that worked out. And I think that wraps it up for all the housekeeping news, signings, injuries, whatnot. So let's get to the interview with Tarek. But before we do that, I think Harry has a little message for everyone from Brackish Life. Let's take a minute to talk about Brackish Life. If you're like us and grew up on the water and outdoors, then Brackish Life is perfect for you. They have a wide selection of gear from UV shirts to hoodies and hats. It's Real Bay Apparel made by Real Bay people. Head to www.brackish.life today to check them out. A little salty, a little fresh, Brackish Life. Brackish Life has also teamed up with Rink to Reef Chesapeake Bay to preserve the area many of us call home. Rink to Reef repurposes broken hockey sticks into oyster restoration habitats. Brackish Life donates a portion of their proceeds to Rink to Reef to further preserve the beautiful Chesapeake Bay area. Support this great cause by checking out www.brackish.life today. We're going to toss it off to Tarek right now. And we are now pleased to be joined by South Carolina Stingray, Tarek Hammond. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate you guys having me. Yeah, absolutely. So like with all of our guests, uh, we kind of like to just get some background information, kind of how you got into the game, where you grew up, if you had like a role model that really got you into the game. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, I was born in 
Regina, Saskatchewan. Um, and, uh, I moved to Calgary, Alberta when I was like one, just, uh, just about one years old. And, um, my family has a long history with, uh, with playing hockey and like everyone else does in Canada, I'm pretty sure. But, um, <laughs> yeah, my, uh, my dad's, uh, father played, he won an Allen cup way back in the, in the day in Canada. And, uh, my dad had a, um, awesome career with uh Regina Pats when he was uh when he was in junior and won a Memorial Cup there and oh wow. played a little bit of pro after but uh yeah I mean nice all my uh, all my family members have have really played hockey and it's just kind of something that we got into and you know I fell in love with it as a kid um right off the bat it it kind of came natural to me I just that's really the only thing I wanted to do with school I didn't like anything like that I just look looking forward to getting to the rink every day so um that was a lot of fun and i mean i just playing up in in calgary um you, you get to play wherever you want there's tons of rinks lots of lots of people to play with and you know i was kind of a, a late bloomer to be honest i i never really knew about the nhl draft i never knew about the whl draft i never i never i just wanted to play really and um mm -hmm. that's kind of the crazy thing about my story is like i was i never made the best teams when i when I um, was younger um, and just kind of like grinded out everywhere, every step that I've been through, it, it's kind of crazy, but yeah, still playing to this day and I'm still enjoying it. There you go. Who was That's, like your uh, hockey idol growing up? Um, first, first is my dad. I mean, he's pretty much taught me everything I've, I've known and he's always the first guy after every game. He's a still to this day, he's the first call I, I make after the game winner loss. Um, but growing up in Calgary, Jerome McGinley was was an icon. He still is. And just the way he handled himself um, through the community I saw growing up and um, just how effective he was in the ice. And it was awesome that I kind of grew up watching him play in Calgary. And the um, biggest thing was that 4 run that oh, they yeah. went on the Stanley Cup. Like, so I still think the goal was in. in I was going to ask, six. like, are you so, one of the people that thinks it was in? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, no, he, he did uh, awesome things for that city. And um, yeah, just, it was really cool to, to watch him play when I was growing up. Did you get a chance to see, uh, I can't remember, I think it was like late last year, the, the video that went viral of him at the gas station? Yeah, what, he, was, so, he was interviewed. Yeah. So where do I don't know where that was. That wasn't Calgary. I'm assuming, right? There's no, no way that would happen. Yeah. yeah. He, he would have got recognized in Calgary for sure. Yeah. I was going to say that that'd be impossible. Oh yeah. I think it was in, I want to say it was in Boston. I don't know if he's still out there, but yeah, I okay. think it was Boston. Yeah. It was pretty crazy. That would never happen in Canada. Right? <laughs> yeah. I wanted to just confirm that. Cause I, that would have been just ludicrous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so growing up a Flames fan, you talk about Aginla. Do you have a current favorite player? I mean, are you still a Flames fan? I've actually got their game against the Habs with Cole yeah. Caulfield's uh, debut right next to me. Ooh. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I I always keep uh, tabs on the Flames. My parents still have season tickets. And whenever I went back uh, in college and stuff and in junior when I was, when I was playing, um, we went to games all the time. So I keep tabs on them. But, you know, I kind of just – I. Sometimes I, I go in like spurts of uh, watching hockey. Sometimes I watch it all the time, like every night, every game, because there's so many on right now. But sometimes I don't really watch it just because I play it so much that it's kind of nice to yeah. get your mind away from things. But yeah, I try to I try to watch and you know pretty much ISO cam some defensemen that I like their games and see what they're doing and stuff because you know it's there's a reason why they're there. So you try to pick up as many things as possible and um, yeah, so. There's a, there's a handful of guys like, um, you know, like a John Carlson. It's so fun to watch. Like he just makes the game look so easy. Yeah. Um, like just like that. And like me being a Flames fan still, like Giordano, he's uh, just still, he's still sure. got it. And I kind of think about his path too. I remember when he was coming up in the, in the Flames organization, he was never, he'd never drafted or anything. And then kind of, grinded out one year, I think, in the minors and then went over to Russia to play and then came back and he just started dominating. So it's it's really cool to see his his path and um, him winning the Norris a couple of years ago is pretty cool to see. So I try to watch him as much as possible. Yeah, yeah for sure. Awesome. Well-deserved too. Uh, I remember yeah. when he won it that year. 
I see. I, I'm glad you brought up the ISO cam thing because I knew Harrison and I were doing something wrong growing up. So I think that's where <laughs> we missed out. You know, if we had done that, we would have been set. But, um, you know, growing up, what was the, you know, for us, the hockey scene in, in the Maryland, D.C. area, you know, it wasn't, you know, the best in the States. Um, the high school I went to had to combine with like two others just to field a, a club team. What was the youth system like uh, growing up in your area? Yeah, um, I mean, in Calgary, it's set up into quadrants, basically. So, like, growing up until you hit, like, I think it's Bantam, you play in your community. So I was, my community, we were the Westwood Warriors. So we were up in the Northwest, and um, we play all the teams in the North. And then you get to, like, uh, there's a always a Christmas tournament that's kind of like the one of the bigger tournaments that we just play out in Calgary, and then the championships at the end of the year. So... You get you go to your community tryouts and they have the one team which is the best and then two and three and all the way down and sometimes like there were years where there was 10 teams there was a division 10 team because that's how many kids are playing so wow jeez um yeah there's it's it's a lot so um and then once you get into bantam you can try out for what's called like uh quadrant hockey so the triple a teams which is the northeast northwest southeast southwest Mm -hmm. um and so i live in northwest but the northeast in calgary was never very good so they started cutting out communities from the northwest to go to so i was the first year that had to go to the northeast but looking back on it it sucked but now i don't i wasn't good enough to make the northwest team with all the with all the good players so i got a chance to play against those guys and actually play in that quadrant quadrant level hockey for the northeast so Nice. It sucked yeah. at the time, but looking back at it now, I think it was one of the best things for me because it gave me a chance to be there and get better and, and play against those those guys that I probably wouldn't uh, have gotten a chance to. So, For sure. Yeah. Um, I'm going to fast forward a, a little bit to your AJHL career. Why don't you educate us a little bit on that? You know, us, us East Coast States people, we're not very uh, up to date on all that. Yeah, it's just, uh, I mean, I, I had a blast. I was... I ended up uh, going to Okotoks. I went to the year after my, I aged out in midget. I think I went to five different spring camps all in a row, five different weekends. My, wow. my parents drove me around. Jeez. <laughs> uh, one out in Saskatchewan and then four in uh, four different teams in Alberta. And so I was, it was just fun to, to go out there and play some spring hockey and try out and, and do all that. And um, I fell in love with Okotoks. They were the only team that didn't offer me a spot on their team after spring camp. But I was like, that's, this is a place I want to go. I want to, sh I knew the guys that were already signed there. I knew I had a chance to beat them out. Um, and, that, and the biggest thing for me was it was 20 minutes or 40 minutes away from my, from my house uh, in Calgary. So billets to my parents' house was 40 minutes. And that was big for my parents coming to the games and stuff. Sure. So, um, great little town just south of Calgary. Um, it was awesome people. I had awesome billets. I mean, we had some great teams there and, you know, I, it worked out so good that I got the opportunity to play there for, for three years and earn a, earn a scholarship from, from playing there. So I loved it. Not a chance I would have been able to pronounce that based on the spelling. Just want to, <laughs> just want to clarify that yeah. I'm notorious for that. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, yeah, it sounds like you had a, a great career in the Alberta Junior Hockey League for those wondering what AJHL stood for. But um, in the 2013 slash 14 campaign, uh, you won the Scott Memorial Trophy for best defenseman in the league. Talk mm -hmm. about, you know, what contributed to your success there and you know, how you made such a big leap. Because like you said, they were the only team who didn't want you. And then there you are being the best defenseman in the entire uh, league. Yeah, I mean, I think it that wasn't just a, a one-year thing. I think it was a culmination of, of all years. Um, my rookie year there, I was in out of the lineup. It was the first time I've ever gotten scratched before. Um, and, you know, that's hard as a kid. Yeah. Um, you played your entire life. You've never really, why am I not playing? I'm healthy. I'm ready to go. Like, um, but, you know, I didn't, I wasn't the type of person that said, get me out of here. I want to try somewhere else. I'd trade me. You know, I put my my head to the to the grindstone and just try to get better every day. And honestly, that's that's the type of person that uh, my parents raised me to be. So just stuck with it. And you know, that last year we had a, we had five of us twenty year olds that were 
rookies together as 18 year olds. So we had a really good, uh, a core group and, you know, I just, I was just playing with confidence. I, I knew the next step if I wanted to play, keep playing hockey at a high level, I knew I had to step things up to, to get a scholarship to go down to the States and play. So, you know, that kind of was always in the back of my mind. And, um, we had a great coaching staff that kind of gave us the tools to, you know, to take our games to the next level and, and get some looks on the NCAA side. So it was, uh, that year was, it was awesome. I think that's the most points I've ever had. So, uh, I wish I was that, uh, offensive nowadays, but uh, <laughs> it was, it was, it was a good time. What was the, uh, NCAA process like for you? Like, what was your recruitment like and how did you end up deciding on Denver in the end? Um, well, first off, I was, I was pretty pissed when I found out that I had to go back to school to, <laughs> to keep my hockey career going. But, um, I think I started talking to a couple of schools, um, my 19 year old year in junior, and it was kind of a, a shell shock for me. I mean, um, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't the best high school student out there. And I think the biggest thing for me was taking those years off from my grade 12 year to college. I needed that time off to kind of mature and. I don't think I would have made it as a, a true freshman. Um, I wasn't mature enough to handle a full course load at plus hockey. So those couple of years really helped me kind of mature and get my mind right. But uh, yeah, once I started, started talking to schools, like, okay, this, this might actually happen. Like, this is something I want to do. And, you know, you got to write the SAT. I think I wrote it like three times, um, sucked the first one, and then just kind of studied and learned how to, how to write it and try to get my grades up for that. And, um, I, uh, my 20 year old year, we had like, um, we always did like a preseason showcase tournament where we'd play a couple teams at our rink and a bunch of schools would come out and watch. And, um, our goalie at the time, Jared D'Amico was talking to Denver and I was like, man, that's so cool. Like that place would be so much fun. I've only heard good things about there. And he came up to me one day, he's like, Hey, I think the, I think the Denver guy, the scout's going to come talk to you. I was like, okay. Like. That's, that's pretty exciting. And so ended up talking with him and, you know, we had a great conversation. And I mean, we had like an actual showcase in the regular season. I think it was like 10 games in and I, I met the scout. Uh, it was Steve Miller the first time, talked to him. And um, I think a couple of days later, they offered me a scholarship. And wow, it was, it was just like one of those things. It was like I, everyone I talked to, they had zero things to say, bad things to say about Denver. I was like, okay, well, do I need to go visit this place or do I just trust them? And I, I know it was the best thing that uh, happened to me. I didn't visit them. I didn't uh, do anything. I was like, let's do it. Like this, this can't be a, a bad place to go. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm looking at your career, just progression at Denver uh, right now. And I think one of the things that you've mentioned just about your story is that, you know, you might get, healthy scratch, but then you work your way up or it's all about getting progression. And kind of like you mentioned with Giordano and man, oh man, did you ever do that at Denver? <laughs> you uh, came a long way. So, I mean, do you want to talk about what your freshman year was like? Yeah. Uh, freshman year, even though I was a 21 year old freshman, it was a, it was an eye opener. Um, you cut like you come from junior and you're the, pretty much the best player on your team to you get to college and you got these guys that are seniors and draft picks and, um, it was it was a big uh, learning curve, that's for sure. And um, my class, we were the first ones to uh, go down there in the summer and um, work out and take classes just to try to get ahead. So that was honestly one of the best things for me is we went down and took three classes and worked out with their their strength coach, uh, Matt Shaw, who I still work out with to this day. Um, he's He's an awesome guy and takes good care of us. And, you know, that kind of set us up for success right off the bat. But you know, it's once you're, once you go into a school like that, uh, that expects to be in the tournament every year and in the frozen four every year and having Jim Montgomery as my coach, you know, he, he demands a lot, but that was, that was a big year for me. And, um, you know, it's frustrating and sitting out and I think I only played like 11 games my freshman year, but, you know, every day I showed up and practices were my games that year. I, I tricked my mind into every day was that practice was the game for me. You know, that was my time to shine. And, um, you know, I put a, a full year into that. I knew my time would come and um, freshman year, I think we lost in the regional finals in Providence and had a good uh, exit meeting. And I was like, okay, well, that year's over with, let's start working towards the sophomore year. And 
I think my sophomore year, I played the first two games of the year. And then the next weekend I got scratched. And I, I told my parents like, this isn't gonna happen again. Like this is the last time I ha this happens and didn't get scratched after that my, my entire four years. So just those, it, it's always happened. And I'm sure people will go through the same thing, but like those practice days for me were, were my moments to shine. And when it was time to go to the workouts, you know, I was trying to be, those were my times to shine. So it all kind of paved, paved the way for me to, to shine really as a junior and sophomore. Yeah, I mean, not only did you not get scratched, I, I believe that Denver has a team award for most improved player, and you, in fact, won that your sophomore year. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty yeah. impressive. Um, just curious, NCAA debut against RPI, what was going through your head? Anything, <laughs> like, funny? Like, did you, like, wipe out in warm-ups or something? Skateguard still on? Anything? Uh, no, nothing like that. Oh. I mean, I, it was a whirlwind, though. It's, like, you 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 practice for, I think we had, like, eight weeks in a row with actual practices. Um, and it's just that you're like so excited for that game and you've been thinking about it for, for so long. And um, I don't think I had the greatest of games that one. I was pretty nervous for it. Um, we ended up beating them, but yeah, it was just, it's a surreal moment and um, to get that first one under the belt. And, you know, I've, I, that was the first time I've ever seen an NCAA hockey game too. Oh, I've wow. never even watched one. That's so, crazy. <laughs> yeah, the first time I've ever seen one an NCAA hockey game was was the one I was in. So it was it was fun, but you know that that's where the work started. I knew that uh, I had to get better each and every day, and um, yeah. So we got to talk about the junior year because obviously that's the <laughs> that's the that's the big one. You guys, spoiler alert, ended up winning the national championship that season. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of our listeners who are kind of in the area that we're in or like New York or the upper Northeast region. Um, it, it, it's kind of a niche, I think, college hockey. Some mm -hmm. people pay attention to it. Some people just watch when the playoffs are on or the frozen four. Um, you know, can you talk about just how crazy that tournament was and what the experience was like and um, just your overall experience? Um, it's special. That's the first word that comes to mind. Um, you know, there's there's guys that I play with nowadays that um, played college hockey and never even got to the NCAA tournament. You know, we I have two Frozen Four appearances in my career and we made the tournament. We were a one or two seed every single year. So um, it's special to be a part of that tournament. And I truly believe it's one of the hardest things to win because you, we've we've lost our seasons ended on a, a, a tough bounce or a, a bad call or something like that. You know, anything can happen in a one game elimination. But yeah, I mean, that first my sophomore year when we went to made the Frozen Four in Tampa Bay, it was uh, it was a pretty surreal moment. I mean, I think we were just happy to be there. Um, we we kind of took it as a you know, a fun trip and we we're just excited to be there. You know, Tampa is a cool spot to, to play hockey, especially at the Lightning's rink and ended up going against North Dakota. And, you know, we tied it up late and they scored uh, a goal uh, late in the third period to, to end up beating us. But, you know, right from that moment, we knew that uh, next time we get there, um, it's going to be a business trip. And that's what the, when my junior year is when we got to Chicago, I think we were number one all year. And, um, you know, we, once we got to Chicago, it was, okay, there's two more games left. We didn't care who we were playing, where we were. Um, didn't care about all the, the festivities and and extra stuff of just being at the Frozen Four. You know, it's it's cool to see, but we didn't really care about that that year. And, you know, it's it's pretty surreal that we got the job done and um, couldn't, couldn't ask for a better group of guys to do it, to be honest. It was, it was extremely special and um, just – you still you still talk to those guys to this day and pictures and stuff pop up and you know we're so close to those guys so it's it's cool that a canadian like me can can be a part of that college hockey uh, niche that you guys talk about it's it's pretty special and i've seen both sides of things with with being from canada and being the a part of the canadian hockey league with the major junior and then playing in the ncaa it's it's pretty cool to have kind of two of those two of those demographics figured out and stuff like that so yeah for sure uh let's talk about that group of guys that you were with because there's some awesome names in there mm -hmm. um so correct me if i'm wrong will butcher was on that team right because i was doing the research and for some reason it just, i couldn't find his name i was like i'm pretty sure he was on that team yeah he was our captain 
And he won the Hobie Baker that year, I believe. Yep. And yep. he beat out, fun fact, Zach Aston Reese for the yep. Hobie Baker that season. I'm a huge <laughs> Pens fan, so that, that's pretty pretty <laughs> oh, interesting yeah. to me. Um, so you, what was Will Butcher like? Because I think now we're at a point where he's in Jersey and they've had a rough kick at the can this season, mm-hmm. but they kind of got screwed with the division, I think. Um, he's definitely kind of coming into his own. And I think going forward with that whole Jersey rebuild, he's probably going to be you know, one of their ace D men going forward. Yeah, I mean, um, I still keep in contact with Butchie to this day. He's, I spent three years with him in college, and honestly, he was one of the first guys to come up with me that freshman year and say, um, hey, if you need anything, like, I'm, I'm always here for you. And he was down there in the summer working out, um, which he didn't have to be, but he wanted to be, um, you know. And he's just, he's not the biggest guy. He's not the fastest guy. He's not, doesn't have the hardest shot. He, He's just smart. He just knows the game. Um, he knows where plays are made. He knows the, that next play mentality. And, you know, he's he's definitely not the loudest guy we for a captain. I mean, he's pretty quiet, but he leads by example. And, you know, I learned so much from him. The year my senior year when I was captain, I, I messaged him constantly and say, hey, like, we're, we're doing this, this, and this. What do you think about this? Or what's your opinion on this? And just say, hey, we're going through this situation. What is, what is, what is something that you did to, to get us out of this? So um, I, I learned so much from him and um, was actually my, after I graduated, um, I signed with uh, Binghamton, got to go to camp with the New Jersey Devils for a couple of days. And um, he was one of the first guys that picked me up and got me out of the hotel. And we watched some Sunday that's football awesome. there. And Nice. Um, yeah, that's yeah, awesome. It was, it was just to see a familiar face around the rink. It was, it was pretty, uh, pretty nice, but yeah, I mean, you know, he's, he's obviously struggling this year, but you know, he's the type of guy that that stuff doesn't get him down. He's, he's going to work hard and, and get back in the swing of things. And he deserve. we all know he deserves to be in that league and, and be a, a go-to guy. So um, yeah, but I, I love that guy. It's tough not to struggle when you're playing Ovechkin and Crosby like 18 yeah. times in the same season. So yeah, I think there's a lot of guys, a lot of guys in that boat. Um, speaking of uh, trophy winners that were also in that team, correct me if my pronunciation's wrong, but your goaltender uh, Tanner Gillette. Gillette, yep. Yeah. Uh, he won the Mike Richter Award that season. And when I did some research on him, um, I, I had never heard of him. I mean, I remember the tournament obviously, but not super specific. And now he's over, I believe, I think he's in uh, Sim Liga. I can't remember what, what it was. But how, how instrumental was he to your guys' win? I mean, obviously, we know goaltending is a huge factor, but um, he was the best goaltender in the entire nation that season. Yeah, he was he was incredible. Um, I played him three years in junior, too, um, and growing up for the same age. We, he was from Red Deer, Alberta, which is just okay. like an in-between Calgary and Edmonton. So we'd always play each other growing up and he was always way better than us. And uh, you could tell that he was going to be something special, but he was really good in junior too. And we kind of committed to Denver at the same time. So we never really talked to each other, but we knew of each other until we actually committed uh, to Denver. And, you know, I lived with him for four years, uh, every year in college and uh, still hang out with him pretty much every summer and uh, in Denver when we get back there in the summers too. So, um, he's just an awesome kid, but he he kind of came in as a as a freshman and knew that he was behind uh, one of the older guys on the team, and you know he's just kind of same work ethic. He 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 battled. You know he's not the biggest guy. I think he's only like five eleven, six foot maybe, and you know uh, he just kind of made the saves that he needed to. I mean it was so simple. It kind of looks like he doesn't he doesn't even try because he just knows where the pucks are going. Um, the biggest thing that I learned from him is. He reads uh, players' blades. That's how he saves pucks. So he knows if a guy's going Interesting. low blocker. So like we we do in like a half moon shooting, and I I try to shoot low glove, and he's already got his glove down there. So wow. like he just it's it's crazy wow. how he do, does it. And like uh, half the time, if guys shooting like high high glove or high blocker, he wouldn't even go down because he just stands there and it hits him. <laughs> like it's it's crazy. I don't know how he how he learned that, but yeah, he's he's special and. It's unfortunate he never got a shot in the North American pro, but I think uh, these past couple of years, him being in Europe, um, he'll, he'll do really good. And um, yeah, he's he was very uh, calming in those 
championship games that we were in. Oh, I'm sure. I think uh, I think that helped us out a lot. I mean, those are some pretty chaotic moments um, in the game. And you always just look at them when you, when you watch those games over, think about them like he's the same guy that he was game one as he is the last game of the year. So I think that was a big, uh, just his poise on the ice was, was incredible and kind of calmed us, us, us down. Do you have any, you know, specific memories? Obviously, you know, I'm sure winning the, you know, the championship is one that you'll always have, but do you have any memories like specifics of teammates or just instances in games during that tournament run that whenever that gets brought up, that's like the first thing that you think of? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think, uh, I think the semifinal game, to be honest, we played Notre Dame. Uh, my junior year in Chicago and it was I think that was the biggest hump for us was because the year prior we we lost in that semifinal game and that's that's uh you just get to go home right away which which sucks um and we knew that that was our first obstacle we weren't even looking towards that championship game and honestly that game against Notre Dame we played the perfect hockey game I watched it over a couple times and you know, we played our systems to a T. We we did everything that we were supposed to do, and that's that's the that's what we were working towards all year. Is we want to peak at that time. You know, that was our best hockey game that I think we've ever played. And you know, I think we we're just so confident after we got a couple goals uh, early in the first, and we were just rolling the whole time. Um, I think spanked them six one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, did something yeah, right. Yeah, so I, it's just kind of everything kind of came together and. You know, we were peaking at the right time and we had so much confidence going into that championship game. So, um, yeah, it was, it was, that was a pretty big one in my mind. One last guy I want to ask you about, and uh, one of Nick's current favorite players, uh, Troy Terry, where we all know about the, the USA uh, World yeah. Junior shootout moments. You ever see anything like that in practice? No, he's actually brutal at uh, shootouts <laughs> in practice. And he'll even admit that, yeah. That's crazy. I don't know. But if for, for some reason in games, he, he just has that, that knack of scoring that way. Um, he's super talented, as you can see. I mean, he's one of my best friends. I, I try to, we try to get together every summer, wherever we are. Um, still talk to him this day, play Xbox with him all the time and stuff like that. So, but yeah, oh, yeah, he's he's got the, a sweet set of, uh, of hands on him. And um, the, the, I think the best thing about him is people don't give him credit for it is he, he works, he works out, he works hard on the ice. He, he's like a dog out there. You know, he's not just a skilled guy that wants things to be easy. He, you know, he, he can be on that F1 on the four check, throw his, throw his frame around as much as he can. But, you know, when it, when it comes down to it, he's able to make those nice plays and, um, and make some guys look pretty foolish out there. So, uh, yeah, he's, it was fun to play with him and watch him. <laughs> Nick, were you going to ask something? I'm sorry. What was he like in college? <laughs> as, a, as a player or as a as a guy <laughs> yeah either one he uh he's funny he's he's witty he's uh he's got a lot of one-liners and he's one of those guys that just can pick up movie quotes and um, okay just just rip them off right away but yeah just some of his mannerisms it's hilarious <laughs> and um you know he's he's just a guy that's like always has a smile on his face and 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 is having fun and you know he's a good guy to be around and Obviously, that kind of correlates with when he's on the ice because he's 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 got a passion for for the game and and loves winning and goes hard and stuff. So um, he's an awesome guy to be around. And one can't really say anything bad about that guy. And then obviously your last season uh, at Denver, you were named team captain, which is a huge honor. Is there mm -hmm. anything that you learned in that experience that you maybe didn't know about yourself or you know just team camaraderie in general prior? Um, yeah, honestly, that was one of the hardest years of my life. Um, it was uh, in the national championship game. I don't know if you guys know, but I broke my ankle pretty bad in, yeah. in the third period. So um, that was in coming back from that. I, I missed the first, I think it was eight games. Wow. Um, spent the whole summer in Denver rehabbing. I, I mean, I had to have a second surgery because my first one really wasn't uh, healing properly. So that kind of sat me back and, you know, it's everyone's there in the summer, having a good time, working out, skating all the time. And, you know, just being named captain, I knew I wasn't going to be ready for the season and didn't really get to see the guys at the rink because I'm just in the rehab room doing my rehab for three, four hours a day, you know? And so that was the hardest thing was 
getting that camaraderie um, back in the team and stuff. And that's where you kind of build your, your, um, your culture in the summer when everyone's down and going, going into the season. So it was hard. It was, as a captain, you want to be there. You want to be a part of things. You want to, you know, that's where you build your connections with the, with the team and the new guys that are coming in. And once you're not playing, it's, it's even harder sitting there, you know? Um, so, but I got to give credit to, to the coaching staff and, and especially our assistant captains. And we had a lot of older guys that were leaders on that team that, you know, kind of took the reins in the games when, when I wasn't playing right off the bat. And, you know, I wasn't healthy. I wasn't, uh, when I got back, I wasn't healthy or, or nearly as good as a player I was before, but, you know, those guys, I, I, they, I think they, they knew I was trying to, to be my best and help the team whichever way I could. And, you know, that's, we, we, we did have a special group that year and obviously fell short. Um, but, you know, those, it was a hard year to, to be a captain and, and coming through a major injury and, you know, trying to, trying to rally the troops as best you could and put your best foot forward. So it was, uh, you definitely learn a lot about yourself in those type of situations. How do you stay positive and just like motivated when you're in that situation where you're not with the guys every day and what you're doing in the rehab facility, you know, it might be painful. It might be annoying. It might be depressing. You know, how do you keep the right mindset in a situation like that? Uh, it's extremely hard. Uh, it's, it's a good question. I mean, I think I've always prided myself on being a positive guy, um, looking at the positives in a lot of situations. Um, you know, it's, you just kind of, think about the next thing you gotta you gotta know that what you're doing is is gonna take you to better spots you know I was there'd be times where I'd come home from rehab and I'd call my parents and I'd be like I can't do this anymore like I this is the most pain I've ever been in like it not, it's not getting better I don't know if I can get through this and you know having that support system with them and my um, my older brother who I'm really close with um, you know they helped me through those moments and um, and with the guys too, I mean, once we got out of the rink, when it's the weekends and stuff, we'd always, we'd always hang out with each other. And, you know, that's, that's the thing times where you can take your mind off stuff and, um, just know that you can get, get away from all that stuff, be a normal student, college student, hockey player, whatever, you know? Um, but yeah, it's, it's hard to be positive in those type of moments, but, you know, every little, every little thing, you know, when I, we'd be bending my ankle back and forth, I'd be in excruciating pain but I always be happy if I got one more degree from last week, you know, those are the things that you kind of work toward and say, okay, well, next week I can start walking and maybe I can do some leg exercises. Um, and also a lot of time in the gym working upper body with our strength coaches. That was a big uh, mental, mental break for me. I think that kept me pretty sane. So got to know those guys pretty well during that, uh, that time, but yeah, it's, it's those, those times are hard. I mean, every athlete's going to go through injuries and stuff. So, it's hard to stay positive, but you've got to know that there's, there's greener pastures on the other side and just, uh, just work through the pain and, and get through it and things are going to get better. So how, how did that injury happen? Was it a block shot? Was it a weird angle into the wall? Like what, what happened? Yeah. So I like routine play. I swung into a guy going into our zone. I kind of like knocked the puck back up um, and he tried to jump around me while we were going into the corner and kind of just like fell down feet first and my right where the board started curving into the corner, my heel hit the ice and my toe hit the boards. And then we both went in. So my ankle just, uh, yeah. So it, no, wasn't, yeah, uh, it I, wasn't a good one. I wasn't, a, I just wasn't sure. I did. I didn't know. You always hear about those, uh, yeah. the ones where the guys go feet first and something. Bumps. Yeah. It's, oh God. Yeah. Um, yeah, every every doctor that I've talked to in my pro career was, doesn't believe me. I heard it playing hockey because such a freak injury for a hockey player to have. Um, they always think I was riding a motorbike or something. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they never believe me. Uh, before we go on to your uh, post college career, is there any player that you got to play against where you were just like, "Holy shit, this guy is <laughs> like just a, a first line NHL or written all over it"? Is there is there anything that sticks out? Um, yeah, I mean, the NCHC, we had a lot of good players. I think, uh, I think it's one of the best conferences in, in NCAA and, you know, every, every conference game is an absolute battle. I mean, we always had battles with North Dakota with, uh, Kajula, Schmaltz and Besser. That was their top line. I mean, 
that's pretty hard to stop if you're out yeah. there against that. It's not a bad top line to have. <laughs> yeah. So, and just watching those guys play, I mean, you gotta, you gotta, they're going to beat you. It's just what, what you can take away and give them the least opportunity to score, but just playing against those guys, it was awesome. I mean, that, those are the type of moments that you want. You want to, you want to compete against those guys, right? And they, those are the guys that make you better. Um, I think Wade Allison on Western Michigan, he was a horse. He was so hard to play against. Um, glad to see he's he's in the NHL after recovering from his injury. Um, I mean, I follow and uh, yep. he was pretty good in Duluth. Like they had a they had a really good team. Just there's the I'm pretty sure every team has a couple guys that we played against that you know knew that they were going to be good in the next level and. Mm-hmm. But that's that's why guys I think want to go play in the NCHCs because you get to play against those guys every night and 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 compete against them and kind of showcase yourselves against them. So it's a it's a special place to, to play. Yeah, for sure. What was your transition like going from Denver to now you sign in Binghamton? What I mean, you know, that's got to be a big shakeup in terms of you know the game itself and where you're living and what your situation is like. So how did you handle that? Uh, it was pretty crazy. I mean, I knew my senior year, I didn't have the greatest of years because of my injury, but I knew that wasn't, uh, I wasn't going to let that define me. So I just really wanted to try out pro. I mean, I knew I always wanted to play pro um, and I just needed an opportunity. And like I've done in junior, like I did in college, I just needed an opportunity. And I was going to prove people wrong. So um, when my agent called me about Binghamton, I had no idea where I was. He's like, yeah, you're going to go to bingo. And I was like, okay. And I looked up where it was and found I was in New York. And so I packed my bags and knew that we had two weeks left. And, you know, I just, I was back to my freshman mindset where this is, this is every day is, uh, is a job for me. I need, you know, um, I was just on a tryout. So nothing was guaranteed every day for me was uh, rent was due. And I still, you know, that, that kind of, that mindset that uh, I've carried with me has really taken me, uh, a, a lot of places so it was it was a great experience I think we played it was two three and threes which was pretty hard to get used to because yeah, we never did that in college <laughs> but I think I played five out of the six games and you know it was a great experience to get me my feet wet and um, really carried confidence over that summer to know that I can play in that league for the following year and lucky enough that uh, they offered me a, just an AHL contract um, after that that summer during that summer and I was excited to go back. I mean, you kind of meet those guys, the coaching staff and the guys. And, and, um, in that, that two week period, I was there at the end of the year and, um, you know, as they gave me an opportunity. So, um, I just tried to roll with it and for a first year pro, I mean, we weren't the best team, but got your feet wet and figured out the league and what you, what the, you talk to the older guys, we had a lot of older guys that, uh, you know, played a lot of games in the NHL and stuff. So it's, it's good to learn from them and, you know, but it's it's definitely a big transition from college. It's uh, even as a 24 year old, I was a rookie, and um, it was pretty crazy to to learn about that kind of stuff. And you got a lot more free time, and you know, it's that's nice for to a certain extent, but you you do get bored after a while. So um, just yeah, just learning the league and players and stuff. And but uh, it was a, it was a good rookie year, I think. What's like the biggest difference? and this is a pretty general question, but between the college game and, and then the pro game, I mean, obviously the speed is a lot, but is there one little detail, like, you know, maybe it's a, a defenseman who can knock a puck, you know, out of the air and mm-hmm. keep it in the zone better than college. Is there, is there one little detail where you're like, huh, that's something different. <laughs> um, I mean, there's a lot of things, but that's one thing that I think the NCHC does um, a really good job of is I think it's the most relatable to pro um they're they're kind of uh, it's their conference style of games it's fast it's big it's it's you know it's dump the puck it's grind it out it's it's skill too so you see a lot of that in pro but i just think even the like the bottom six forwards the five six d pairing in pro you know they can make plays you know they can make those little silk silky plays through the middle or you know just keeping pucks alive on the wall or um just like just the little details you know and and you see that your first week of practice and in, in pro is you, you do through you go through all the the line rushes and stuff and then guys are staying out there after to work on those little things you know every day that's part of their job is to work on those little things every day so it shows up in the games obviously and yeah just everyone everyone is 
there's no guys that you're like, okay, well, this guy, we can, we can walk around, you know, that's, that doesn't happen. That's, that's long gone until I get to retire and get the men's league. But um, <laughs> yeah, every, everyone's, everyone can play the game. You know, everyone can surprise you. Take someone lightly, you know, they're going to make you look bad. So you always got to be on your, uh, on your toes. Yeah. And then um, after your stint in Binghamton, uh, you come over to South Carolina, which yep. is, you know, couple guys that we've had on the team on the show before so we're obviously a little biased we, we like them <laughs> um what's your experience been like down there so far i mean obviously covid's kind of hampered everybody's experience but you got warm weather i don't know if you yep. golf we've talked to dan before you got golf courses down there so hopefully oh, yeah. there's some stuff to do yeah it's been it's been awesome um my uh that last year i signed a deal with hershey it was just a two-way deal um, so I knew that there was a chance of me going to South Carolina and I was like, ah, that can't be a too bad a spot to go. So, um, worked out well. I mean, I, I spent the whole year in South Carolina last year and, you know, we had such a good team. It was so much fun. Um, it's, it's a shame that, uh, the season got canceled cause we were just gearing up for playoffs and, and getting things ready, which, which was tough, but you know, stuff happens and, um, was excited that I got the opportunity to come back this year, you know, same, same, pretty much. We had a lot of guys from last year on our team this year, so we're excited about it. And yeah, you can't beat the weather down here. People are people are super nice, and we get treated really good. And um, try to get out just golfing with Dan as much as possible. And, <laughs> uh, there's some nice courses that uh, down here. Like last year, we played the Kiwa Island Ocean Course, Oof, where they're having nice. the PGA this year. So yeah, yeah that's that was awesome. just like doing stuff like that. It's awesome and. It's weird, like last year when I came down here, it's you you, you go outside and you're sweating again because it's humid and hot and yep. you have shorts on going to the rink and Canadian kids aren't really used to that. Like it feels weird. Yeah, I was <laughs> but, gonna say uh, that's a culture shock. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I think I've gotten soft now because I go back home and it's cold and I'm wearing <laughs> pants and it's only, it's like 20 degrees out. So uh, yeah, but love I love it down here. That's why I wanted to come back and we're, we're in a good playoff push here. So we're looking to, to make some moves in these last uh, 20 games here. Yeah. I was going to ask, how's the season going so far? I mean, we've been paying uh, some attention just cause you know, we've had some guys on the show. Yeah. So uh, what, what can we expect, you know, here down the home stretch? Yeah, it's, it's been a weird year. I mean, you knew going into this, it was going to be a weird year with all the COVID restrictions and stuff. And, you know, it's, it's a, uh, there's some teams that didn't want to play because of things and that, there's a lot of extra guys out there. So, um, everyone's better, you know, it's, it's, a. I wouldn't say it's, it's more comparable to the AHL than the, than the East coast, to be honest, in my, in my personal opinion, just because the, the guys on, uh, every team they they've, they really stacked up and, um, guys want to play obviously. So there's, there's going to be uh, a lot of demand for roster spots. And, um, but yeah, it's, we, we've been struggling. I mean, it's, compared to last year we're not doing very well but you know this this we got a, a young head coach and an assistant coach and we're just kind of learning to you know to mesh well and um we got we got a lot of guys like i said coming back that came back from last year um and it's part of the process that we just keep getting better every day and you know it hasn't been our our best season but we're not out of it so we're excited about these uh these last 20 games and we got a big road trip down to florida for i think uh three in orlando and three in florida um, so that'd be a, a big weekend for us or week coming up. So we're pretty excited about that. Yeah. There was like one whole division out of that league that opted out. Right. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So even like, uh, Atlanta opted out and Norfolk okay. opted out. And I think most of the Western, um, teams, they opted mm -hmm. out. Okay. Yeah. So all their, like all their players that were signed for next year or this year, they have to, they just get released and are free agents. So right. they're obviously going to want to play. So sure, yeah. there's a lot of, a lot of battling for first spots and stuff. How it was at the start of the year, but yeah. Any dirt you can give us on Dan? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dan. He's also uh, having a pretty good year. I just checked. He's, he's got 38 points in 45 games. I mean, he's, He's an well. incredible player, to be honest. It's it's crazy what he can do on the ice. He just can he can just take over games. And the best thing about him is he's an awesome guy too. So um, it's been he's... fun hanging out with him. And I was I was the first guy when you guys reached out to me. I was the first guy uh, I reached out to 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 give you guys <laughs> the, give me the deets on you guys. But no, he's 
yeah, he kind of, he's the engine of our team, to be honest. If he's going, like, he drags everyone with him, you know, um, and he pretty much every night he has it. So it's pretty fun to, to play with him and, and uh, be his he, teammate. He seems like a funny guy. I mean, he's, he se- when we talked to him, he seemed high energy, but his, his damn camera wouldn't work. So we couldn't, <laughs> oh, really, really? so we couldn't see his face. So like, I mean, you can only, you can only judge so much what a guy's yeah. like when you can't like see the interactions. So, yeah. Um, he, uh, yeah. He's, he's a pretty goofy guy. I mean, he's uh he likes to throw a couple bucks on the, on some hockey games every now and then. So he gets pretty wild about that. And he'll be, on the bus, he'll be screaming at his iPad or something like that. It's, it's yeah, it's pretty funny. That's just, that's us every night. So yep. yeah. <laughs> um, who's better at golf, you or him? Oh well, when I got called up, I didn't have my club, so he had seven weeks on me mm-hmm. to 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 practice. But yeah, I would say he he, he takes it more um, more competitively. I'm more of like a, let's go out on a day off, have a couple beers, get around and enjoy the enjoy the outside. I'm. I'm not too competitive about it. What I'm you competitive shoot? on the ice, not not. There you golf. go. What are you shooting? Uh, I on a good day I'd be like mid mid 80s, but that rarely happens That's... nowadays. So I'd say like mid 90s. I've I've had a couple in the hundred this year too. If I'm proud to say that, but hey, no shame in that. I'm right there with you. I'm I'm out there to have a good time. So I could shoot 200 and I'd still have a great time. So yeah, I don't know if you find this, but like. I mean, I played hockey growing up and obviously not to the degree that you did, but you play an indoor sport where it's like freezing cold. And then any chance you get to do something remotely athletic outside, to me, at least it's like refreshing. I'm like, oh, this is what like, yeah. you know, most kids when I grew up did like, I, so I always try to just get outside. Have you ever noticed that? Like, oh yeah. Um, I've fell in, kind of, especially during COVID year, like this past summer, um, really fell in love with golf because it was really the only thing we could do in Canada that was open. Um, but yeah, I was, um, I wish I played baseball more to be, be honest, as a kid, we didn't really have the weather for it in Calgary, but I mm. wish I would have played more. I was a big, uh, roller hockey guy growing up. That was my summer sport. So technically yeah. still inside, but, um, yeah, I love playing roller hockey, but yeah, I've really found a passion for golf and just the connections you can make through golf. I think that's the most important thing. You did, if you know the game, you know the rules. Um, that's that's good business connections to have. And for sure, um, if you know if you know what to do out there, it's uh, you're going to get invited back, and that's how you make connections. So I'm a yeah. big believer of it's not what you know, it's who you know. It's all about who you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. I mean, is there any any questions that you might have for us or? I'm good. I mean, this is my first podcast, so hopefully I did all right. <laughs> no, you're, yeah. you did great. Congratulations. It was yeah. our first one, too. <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to keep up with you guys. This is fun. Appreciate you guys uh, having me on. Yeah. yeah if, if you're ever uh, trying to join Dan and throwing some bucks on some games, we're definitely your, uh, your one-stop shop. Uh, all um, right. We're, you know, we're trying to, Nick and I have talked about it. We're going to try at some point to get to see a game for you guys. Cause we've had some guys on the show. I don't know yeah. if we'll get, I don't know if we'll get down to South Carolina, but do you guys play wheeling between now and the end of the season? I think they come to us. I think, uh, I think the South Carolina, we just went there a couple weekends back and then their ice machine okay. broke. So they had to cancel two games. That was when I was still called up, but um, yeah, I think they come down to us at the end of the year. If I'm not mistaken, okay. but could be wrong. Okay. No, I was just wondering that. It's probably the closest one to you, hey? Yeah, probably. Probably. Three-ish, yeah. three and a half hour drive. Not too yeah. bad. Not bad. Not that I mind flying to South Carolina and Charleston. <laughs> hey, <but> right. Yeah. <laughs> bring, bring your golf sticks and uh, then we'll, we'll get out and play some That's what I'm That'd saying. Yeah. For sure. That's Make a I'm trip saying. out of it. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, any ridiculous coast stories? <laughs> oh, God. Where do I start? <laughs> Um, I mean, I wasn't there, but the, the ice machine breaking and wheeling, that's, that's pretty typical coast. I would say, um, I got to think there's so many, there's always a bus trip. I feel like involved. Yeah. Somehow. I mean, last year it was like, whenever we played Jacksonville, it was always like a Sunday three and three at like three o'clock. Um, so we'd have to get up early and, and, and then hit the bus and, the first three times we went down there, our bus broke down, like three separate buses. It's always a so bus. One, one time we were in the middle of the highway on the left side of the road and our bus broke down, couldn't move. 
So we had oh, to man. we had to wait for that other bus to come. They had to block the road off so we could get our gear underneath, move it over to the other bus, and then get to go. And we showed up like 20 minutes before the game. I think we ended up winning, which is surprising. <laughs> um, yeah, it helped to be a really good team last year. We could just show up, and yeah. sometimes you're put your put your best foot forward and come out come out with a win. But yeah. yeah, you know this. I would say this league's built character. There's there's a lot of things that don't make a lot of sense, but Hey, we get paid to play hockey and you know, there you go. I could, you, I could be you, working a nine to five construction job. Um, but I'm getting paid to play hockey and doing what I love. So you won't hear me complaining about it too much. No, nah, you're living the dream. Truly. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, we're the rat race is trying to just do this podcast. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate the time and, uh, you know, good luck the rest of the season and we'd love to have you on again. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Appreciate for for having me on. It's been yeah, awesome. no problem. Big thanks to Tarek for talking to us and you know sitting down and sharing his story with us. Super nice guy, super down to earth. And I think my favorite thing about him was you could just tell how driven and determined and motivated he was throughout everything that he's encountered in his career. You know, he talks so many times about how he would encounter a setback in his career, whether that was not having a great freshman season at uh, Denver or you know that gruesome injury he suffered in the in the national championship game and having to recoup and, you know, basically reteach himself how to walk and stuff like that. So I uh, just wanted to say a huge thanks to him uh, and we will keep rolling here. Uh, so before we get to all the good gambling stuff, we just want to remind everyone that these picks are brought to you by the Maryland mortgage whiz. If you're planning on buying a home this year, get pre-approved and explore all financing options with Dave Fritz, the mortgage whiz. Interest rates are at a historic low and down payment assistance programs are available. Stop renting and put your money in a place that you can call home. Follow Dave on Instagram at Maryland underscore mortgage underscore whiz for more information. Dave is licensed in Maryland, Delaware, and Florida. Equal housing lender NMLS number 3094. All right, Harry, what have you liked this past week? I think you had a pretty good week, so. I've had a couple good weeks. You know, yeah. I, went on, I went on about a, a bad month. Just a bad, <laughs> bad month. March was not good. Early April, we started turning things around, and now we're full steam ahead, so we're rolling. Um, Retweet. I'm the same. Yeah, that we're, we're, we're rolling right now. So follow us on Twitter if you're not already. That's where we post all the initial picks. We throw them on the Insta story, but if you want all the good, juicy stuff uh, ASAP, follow us on Twitter at Empty Betters. <clears throat> so uh, a lot of this is going to be recapping what we said last week because, boy, did that work out well. Uh, McDavid. I mean, he was at home twice last week, and we told you guys on last week's show that he's averaging over two points per game at home, and boy, oh boy, did he just blow up last week. He had six points in two home games, and I don't know if you saw the game last night, wasn't home, was in Winnipeg, and put up four points. He is now the fastest player to 80 points since Mario Lemieux in 2000 and 2001. He's done it in 41 games. Just that's bonkers to think about. I mean, I don't want to like be prisoner of the moment, but just based on what we're seeing, this is probably the most dominant season we've seen a player have in our lifetimes. I mean, honestly, I would say since like point scoring wise, yes, that's fair. Yeah, just in every facet yeah. of the game. Um, I know Nick has a fancy McDavid stat that I won't steal from him that I was about to, but I'll let him read that later. <laughs> um, no, I'll read it now, actually, while we're talking right. about it. So at five on five, the Oilers are plus 88 in scoring chances with Connor McDavid on the ice, which is a lot. That's a huge number in terms of, you know, relativity to your opponent. And without him on the ice, they are minus 183. <laughs> so with him on the ice, they're getting 88 more scoring chances than their opponent. And without him, they're getting 183 less yeah, which is just it's mind boggling to to think that he makes that much of an impact on the ice for his team. And that is why the Oilers as a team are still not ready to win a Stanley Cup. Literally, exactly. That's that right there. Yeah. Why. Yeah. And I would agree with that. Just it, it, it stat is just mind boggling, though. Um, another mind boggling stat. If you took away secondary assists from McDavid's stats log, stat log this season, he would still be second in the NHL with wow. 63 points. And that was as of yesterday before the Winnipeg game it's probably up to 66 points now and then he'd be in the lead so that's a great stat I love that one 
Um, just an absurd display of skill and determination that we're seeing this season. Now, granted, I did see some things on Twitter. He's playing in the division where it feels like every game's a shootout for the yeah. most part. So, I mean, he is terrorizing teams that are defensively, I'd say, weaker Bad. than most. Yeah, I guess you could say that. Um, but nonetheless, just I don't think we've ever really seen something quite like this. It's not an excuse. It's just like, holy shit. Uh, and the Mike Matheson props. I mentioned it last episode. They've been cashing very well as of late. Here's another Penguins defenseman who's performing unreal this season compared to what the expectations were. Cody Cece, a guy that I shit on in our season preview hard, very hard. Very hard. He, ha- he has the most even strength points among defensemen in the entire NHL since March 27th. So we're taught today is April 27th. In the past month, Cody CC has the most even strength points among defensemen in the NHL. That's nuts. I can't believe that. So I would say keep an eye out on prop bets for CC. You're going to get them at an absurdly good value. I'd say probably in the plus 170 range to get one point. Figure Matheson's at plus 145. Usually I could see CC around plus 170. <clears throat> also, not a, uh, a trend, but did you guys see the Crosby puck line cover against the Devils on Saturday night? I don't. I think you're mistaking us for people that watch Penguins games. No, this one, this one, <laughs> well, RA was all over it, but just like 0.01 seconds left or 0.1 seconds left. He fires it from in front of Jari 200 feet down the ice into the empty cage. They didn't call it a goal at first. And then they went to replay it across the line with like a millisecond left. Wow. And it was, did nuts. you have puck line? I did not, but I like, just cause I know what, like how many people were. Someone did. On that. Someone yeah. for sure did. Yeah. Someone did. So I was like, man, that's a, that's gotta be a good feeling. But somebody else probably had, who were they playing? The devils. Yeah, somebody else probably had Devils plus one and a half and yep. yeah. got Just screwed. Got so screwed out of that. That's the way it goes. Um, keep the Penguins train rolling. Uh, they're unreal at home this season. They have the best home record in the league. They are 23 and two. Uh, that's 20 3 2 at home so far this year. So I would definitely be keeping an eye on their puck lines when they're at home. They play the Bruins tonight. We'll see how that goes. I don't have a good feeling. Uh, John Tavares, a guy that we have kind of slept on and is strangely like in the Mecca. He's the captain of the biggest media hockey center in the world. And somehow he doesn't get talked about like ever. Uh, He's riding an eight game point streak right now. So I would keep an eye on the John Tavares point props. Most people are usually always going after Marner, Nylander or Matthews, rightfully so. Uh, But I think you can get some good value with Tavares right now. Uh, Sam Bennett, I am going to save the statistics for this for the first liner segment because spoiler alert. And if you follow us on Twitter, you know, this, he's going to be my first liner for this week. And I'll give you guys the lowdown when we get to that. And then Alexis Lafreniere, um, he may have laid a dud in Zach Jones's debut, which I bet, but he has looked very good in the two games since then. And now has three points in his last three games since getting bumped up to the first line. So I would definitely keep an eye on Laffy props. I think he's looked a lot better. You know, I think it was probably just one of those things where it was taking time and now he's getting some first line minutes where he's getting guys that can really set him up and make some space for him. So, yes. um, Oh, one last one. Uh, Sam Reinhart of the Sabres has 10 points in his last 10 games and he is third in the NHL in scoring in the month of April. Wow. Yeah. Um, Yeah. The Sabres got hot, like right after the trade trade deadline, of course, for, seemingly no reason but they've had some uh they've had like two or three players that have really just stepped it up yes so keep him on your uh, radar yeah um for me i had a solid week with the hurricanes uh their puck line was great for me i got it at a plus 230 the other night uh that was easy money uh they made me a little bit nervous during the middle of the game but then sort of you know pulled it away and closed it out with an empty net or you know the old-fashioned way uh, but they're red hot and basically a lot, I've found that a lot of bets are working for them right now. Um, stick them in a parlay. I know I have that going on tonight, but even look at their overs. I mean, we talked about the Canes that have a great defensive core, but as we've talked about a thousand times, the Canes biggest problem is their goaltending. So if they're not stopping, you know, the other team from putting the puck into the net, like they did with Dallas last night when it was like, what four, three overtime win for the stars, there's an over cover for you. So 
look at their overs. I think that's certainly worth your time. Even, you know, going into the, the cats and the bolts, I feel like that's very similar. You know, they do put up like four or five goals a game and then they're usually good for giving up three. If it's a less than average night. And if it's an average night, one or two, which still puts you right there at that six, six and a half number anyway. So uh, definitely worth your time and money, I think. Um, yeah, I didn't get a lot of betting done this past week, just with being on the road and everything. One thing that I'll reiterate that I've talked about before, especially now that most teams, if you're not the Canucks have like, I don't know, eight ish games left somewhere around there. Um, look at those, just look at those trends, uh, between those teams and the team series and everything. Uh, most teams will probably play their final one or two or possibly three games against certain opponents in the next week or two. So just looking at that and really just trying to play a guessing game too of what, what's going to happen that final game of the series based on what's already happened. Um, I also think it's time to talk about like starters getting rested. Cause as we get closer to the playoffs, that's probably going to start happening too. Um, Usually if you go on a team's like Twitter, you can see their starting lineups at least like 30 minutes or an hour before the games. Um, just seeing who's on the ice for warmups and everything like that. So I've been trying to do that before I really lock anything else in just to make sure I know that like somebody's not sitting for some weird reason. That's a good point, especially with the teams that have already clinched. You look at Colorado, you look at Vegas, you know, even a team like Minnesota, you know, I'm sure they're still going to be playing for, you know, a, a more favorable matchup, but you know, right. It, it really with goaltenders, I think that's a, that's a big thing too. And in the uh, other uh, regard, that's not what I was trying to say. The other uh, end of the spectrum, uh, the teams that are competing right now, you're starting to see some of their top tier prospects come up. So that's something to keep an eye on. We saw right. that with Cole Caulfield in Montreal. Yep. Uh, we're seeing that with Joe Valino tonight with uh, the Detroit Red Wings. So yeah, keep an eye on the young guns coming up and making their NHL debut. Zach Jones, um, we got all these guys coming. So no doubt, uh, definitely something to pay attention to. Alrighty, all right, here is about Sam Bennett. What's yeah. what do you got here? What's the word? All right, so first line or fourth line, or my first line is going to be Sam Bennett. Uh, he has seven points in his first six games as a Florida Panther, and he says this is the most fun that he is having in his career. Shots fired at U Calgary. Uh, the cats have looked very good since acquiring him. And I'm also going to have a, a second first liner instead of a fourth liner, because I think this guy deserves some love. I don't think he gets talked about enough. I'm going to go with Jake Gensel. Here's a fun stat. Jake Gensel has 171 points now in his last 170 games played. Never would have guessed that. And he has 81 goals in that span now, which is nuts. So uh, props to Jake. He's, He's a good player. I think a lot of people think he just rides Sid's coattails, but he knows how to play. So I, I'm giving him some love. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you have to give some love to the, to the guy feeding him the puck too, though. So. Oh no. I mean, yeah, it's just, I, I think that Gensel has, I think I said, I can't remember who I said this to, but it's strange that for Crosby has been in the league since Oh five, this is truly, I mean, I know we had Kunitz and we've had Dupuy and Hosa for a short stint, but never really had a, it took it took 12, almost 13 years to find a winger who, like, actually can, like, play, like, really play. I mean, I love Chris Kunitz, but he he truly rode the, the coattails. I mean, that's – there's no way around that. I think Jake can be his own player. So Yeah, fair point. I completely so, agree. Crazy American guy, too. Got to love that. Yeah, good old Nebraska guy. So uh, My first liner is going to be Cam Talbot. He had five wins in the last week and a half and led my fantasy team with 31.8 points in the first round of the playoffs to send honey nut Chelios to go put a boat on the water, baby. Going to go after the ship, looking forward to it. Got a good showdown with a friend of the program, Matt Curtin. So I'm excited, but yeah, wouldn't be there without Cam Talbot. Wait, you got a fantasy update at the end, right? Cause I want to hear about it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We'll get into it more. Um, and then my fourth liner is going to be Nils Hoglander. I remember I said, you know, at the beginning of the year, keep your eye on this kid. And he had a great start uh, to the to the season. I remember I drafted him with like probably my last pick in my fantasy draft. And he was so far down the list, but like was a solid one and a half sort of point of game guy. Now he's just 
you know, nine goals, 10 assists, 19 points in 41 games. And he only had three points in the entire month of February. So tough for him. I know it's been tough for the Canucks all season, but uh, yeah, that's my fourth liner for the week. I think Harry bet him and won on like a plus 600 bet or something <laughs> yeah. for him to get a goal. And what was that? His first game his first, or something? Yeah, it was, it was his first game. I said, Hey guys, Hoglander. It was like plus 470 and it hit. So nice. All right. So my first liner is Berkey, Andre Burakovsky, former capital, current Colorado Avs player. He's got two goals and three assists over this past week. Um, so good for him getting hot at the right time. Uh, he's a gamer in the playoffs, especially he helped us a lot out, uh, helped us out a lot on that run in 2018. So it'll be interesting to see if he can kind of ride this hot streak into the playoffs. Um, Fourth liner, I'm going to go with Yoel Farabee for the Flyers. Um, you know, he's a young player. I don't think anybody expected him to have as good of a season as he's been having in the first place, so it might be a little unfair to me, but we like to hold guys accountable. Um, he has uh, just one point in his last five games, and that's just an assist. Uh, and he's just, you know, this is not the time for the Flyers to cool off. It's, it sucks that there's been a lot of weight put on him because you got guys like Kevin Hayes that aren't really producing as much as they should be. But, um, yeah, I think it's more than safe to say that the Flyers are toast at this point. Um, definitely. Yeah, and fair B not scoring doesn't really help. That's all. No Rangers fans. Y'all better be rooting for Pittsburgh tonight. Holy shit. It's getting close. Boston Pitt. Right. Uh, I, I hate to I hate to break it to the Rangers fans, but I don't I don't. It's not looking great right yeah, now. Yeah, it's going to be tough. It's yeah. going to be tough, and it's not they're, even really their. They're going to need a lot it's of just, help. Yeah, they just they're probably going to do what they need to do, but it's not going to be enough. You know. Yeah. I was talking to Mark. Uh, what was it late last week? He said, "You know, it's you know, it's hard to swallow." I said, "What?" I said, "If we didn't miss Panarin for a month, we would be in the playoffs." And I said, "You know what? You're probably right." Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so could be. I think that's a fair argument that you could make. Oh yeah. Well, ever since uh, I almost said Putin, ever since Panarin's come back, um, he's been on fire. I mean, yeah, it's crazy. Not Putin, P- Panarin. Yes. Yeah, there we Big go. Big difference. Big difference. <laughs> all right, market report. Yeah. Um, all right, the up team. We got Minnesota Wild. So they've won seven straight games. They're eight one and one in their last ten. Uh, they've been great on the road in the past week. So that's something that you guys should keep an eye on and they clinched a playoff berth. So it's all good up in mini. My down team is going to be the Chicago Blackhawks uh, for a team that was looking really good, like early midway through the season, they've kind of fallen off the wagon. Um, St. Louis has kind of overtaken that last playoff spot. And I don't really think that Chicago is going to have a chance to catch them. So it's a good run by the Hawks this season. Um, some young guys showed some good development, but ultimately felt kind of short. And I thought that, you know, they probably should have made that fourth spot. I think that with the way that St. Louis has looked at points during the course of the season, I think the Hawks could have, uh, could have taken that. So it was definitely open for the taking, but yeah, just didn't shape out that way. My up team is going to be the Vegas golden Knights. Yeah. Believe it or not, I'm going to pump their tires real quick. Actually, They've won nine straight. They're nine, one and oh, in their last 10, they have the most points in the league. They have the fourth best home and road records in the league. They have the best goal differential of any team with a plus 57. And they have the fewest goals allowed as a team this season with 103, their fifth most in goals scored as a team. And they're, they have the most wins in regulation plus overtime on the season at 33. Wagon. They are just a complete wagon at this point. Yeah, sheesh. That's scary. I don't like hearing all those stats. No, but, uh, not at all. Not to mention they've got what I would say is the best goaltending duo in the league as well. Yeah. It's when you got the one-two punch point. of Robin Lanner and Mark andre Fleury, I think if any of those guys even has a slightly shitty game, you're you're coming right back with the next guy guns blazing. So that's pretty scary. Yeah. This is this is one for the record books. You two kind of complimenting the Vegas Golden Knights. I don't think I've ever heard that before. 
don't get used to it. <laughs> Got to give credit where credit's due as much yeah. as I hate them. Seriously. Or, or you're going to have to get used to it with the way they're playing. I guess Seriously, we'll we might. Uh, and then all those stats were pretty impressive. But I think this one's even more impressive. Not if you're a Flyers fan, because there is my down team. They've allowed the same number of goals against as the Buffalo Sabres this season. A That's... tie for worst in the league. So just You can let... chalk that up to like two awful games against the Rangers. Yeah, just <laughs> let that sink in. So... That's absolutely crazy to me. Yeah. I, I, who would have thought that? What? A, so, do you think Hart is like? What's the future? I mean, what what do you do? I like, think he's still the future. I think it's just a bad season for him. I don't I think, think a lot he, of goalies just have a bad year yeah. sometimes. It sucks, but and I, you know, I think the thing that we always forget is how young guys are. With him, yeah. he's like what? He's twenty two. Yeah. yeah. I think so. so no, I, I think he'll bounce back. It's just. A, Strange, because this isn't his sophomore year now. This is his third year, I believe. I think so. Not as yeah. the full time starter, but right. third year. In third the year. NHL, yeah. yeah, yeah. So kind of strange to see that. I also uh, have been looking at Flyers Twitter. Don't recommend it, by the way. Um, they're missing Matt Niskanen right now, mm-hmm. and I, I guess we didn't understand how big of a part he played in uh, the Flyers defensive core. But you guys know this and I know this too. Yeah. He is the perfect second pairing guy. Like yeah. he yeah. is so steady Eddie. Yeah. He can move steady the Eddie is the best way to describe him. Yep. He's the best, he's the best second line defenseman to have. That's like that anchor. So I, I think they're missing him. Yeah. Great locker room guy too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're also probably missing elite NHL defenseman Radko Gudis, but <laughs> Yeah, he, sure. he's actually been uh, doing okay in Florida. He has been doing. The okay guys in love Florida. him too. Yeah. I saw some interview with like somebody else on the team. They all love him. So yeah, I'm sure. Sh- I'm uh, sure he's hysterical in the locker yeah. room. Yeah. Um. All right. My up team is guys. It's the Dallas Stars. Don't look now. I said this last week too, but don't look now. Once again, they are two points out of a playoff spot, and they've got two games in hand to the Predators, who they're chasing for that final spot. Um. Whoever gets this fourth spot in the central between those two is going to be, I mean, this is going to be a sick race just to put it in perspective for you guys. Uh, Carolina's in first Florida's in second and Tampa's in third. And that is like a three point race right there between those teams. Um, But nobody's catching those three. Like those three teams will finish one, two, three in whatever order for fourth place. It's either going to be Nashville or Dallas. Cause we talked about Chicago is pretty much done at this point. And Nashville has played 50 games. They've got 56 points where Dallas has played 48 games. They've got 54 points. So this is going to be a battle. And I'll tell you why that uh, suddenly the stars are right here. It's because they've won seven out of their last 10 games and they've got points in nine of their last 10 games. So the stars are heating up. I, I have a hard time believing that they're going to catch the Predators just because I've watched a lot of Predators games in the last couple of weeks, and that looks like a team that wants to make the playoffs and wants to win in the playoffs behind UC Soros. So I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen here, but it's going to be a really fun um, finish to watch. Um, let me just look at one thing. I should have looked this up before, but I'm curious if they play each other just one more time. I completely agree with you, Mac. I was watching that Stars. They do. They uh, do. Yeah. yeah. They play each other this Saturday, so that's going to be a huge, Ooh. huge game. Ooh. I was watching their game against the Hurricanes last night, and they are, like, I would say they have the most momentum of any team in the league right now. Yeah. Just uh, yeah. just off of recency bias. Like, Vegas, yes, Vegas was cruising. We knew that. Colorado was cruising. We knew that. Dallas is getting hot at the right time, and they're mm-hmm. they're putting together a legitimate push. They got the extra point last night in that overtime game, and they desperately yeah. needed it. And you could see the, uh, you know, Jamie Ben's reaction to the mm-hmm. to scoring the overtime winner was great. Like, he was just so fired up about it. So And Carolina looked crushed, too, because they know they want to finish first. They don't yeah. want second place. They want to finish first and draw Nashville or yeah. Dallas. Uh, instead of having to face the bolts or something like that in the yeah. first round. So, and I, I will give them credit. I thought, or I'll give their goalie credit. I thought Reimer looked really good for the Canes last night. He yeah. got beat on a Gurianov goal that no one would have ever stopped, but, um, I believe that's yeah. a, another rematch tonight. Kane stars. Yep. That should yeah. be really interesting to see yeah. what happens there, but that's going to just watch that division in general. It'll be really interesting to watch that top three team battle. And then also, that final battle for that final spot between Nashville and Dallas. I Moving think that, on. Oh, yeah, go I, ahead. 
I think you know, last thing I'll say is I think that division could produce some like just wonky playoff series, like For sure. oh, big yeah. upsets, stuff like that. That Robertson kid that you talked about last week, Nick, he's Robertson, Robert. It's, is it not Robertson? I thought, whatever. He's yeah. nasty. He's yeah. very, oh, he's very awesome. Good. Yeah. Uh, so my down team is going to be Arizona. Um, they're blowing it at the worst possible time for a while. It looked like they were maybe going to sneak in, but they've lost eight of their last 10. Um, and that puts them, you know, they're still hanging around. I think they're only one. Yeah. They're one point out, but I don't know. It seems like St. Louis has kind of got their shit together at this point. So I don't know if Arizona can catch them for that, but another thing to keep your eyes on. They've also played more games than the blues. So yeah. It's exactly what you said. Uh, St. Louis got their shit together and Arizona is like the, <laughs> like the, the, I don't even know. I'm trying to think of an acronym, but they're just so up and down. They beat, yeah. some, they ho- they hang in with some of the best teams and then they just drop games to the worst teams. If you yeah. want betting advice, just never touch the coyotes. You never know what you're going to get. That's great advice. Like that. They, what they do is they play to the level of their opponent. Like yeah. if it's a really yeah. good team, Harry, like you said, they're, they're playing really well. If it's a dumpster fire team, they let their inner dumpster fire out. So, uh, yeah, that wraps it up for first and fourth liner. We wanted to add a little free agency watch. I know everyone's excited about the playoffs, but I think there's some important names on this list that I'm about to read that might make you a little bit nervous about your favorite player or your favorite team. So the following players are expected to become unrestricted free agents this off season. So for forwards, we have Alex Ovechkin, Ryan Nugent Hopkins, Gabe Landeskog, Taylor Hall, Mike Hoffman, Zach Hyman, Brock McGinn, Kyle Palmieri, Joe Thornton, Alex Ayafalo, Blake Coleman, Jaden Schwartz, David Krejci, and Nick Foligno. For defensemen, we have Tyson Berry, Dougie Hamilton, Alec Martinez. And for goalies, we have Philip Grubauer, Tuka Rask, Peter Mrazek, Freddie Anderson, Chris Dreger, James Reimer, Yaro Halak, Brian Elliott, Mike Smith, and Devin Duby Dubnik. What names on this list, you know, I know Ovi, obviously, stand out to you guys as big ticket names could make a huge splash in the free agent market this offseason? Well, I think there's a handful of them that are all but said and done going to resign. I do think Ovi is one of those. So, uh, I mean, you never know, of course, you never know what's going on behind scenes, but you'd like to think that they've kind of got something worked out and they're just not going to put the pen to the paper until after that expansion draft. Um, but there's definitely some players on here that probably won't be resigned. And, uh, you know, I think it'll be interesting to see what happens with Taylor Hall. I think it'll be interesting to see what happens with some of those goalies too, um Grubauer and Rask in particular is going to be really interesting I think and then the only thing I'll touch on with defensemen is Tyson Berry I think he uh what he was with Toronto right and he had a terrible year and everyone was like this guy is trash now but he's actually been pretty decent this year for Edmonton I think so it'll be interesting to see if somebody's willing to spend big money on him again uh, or if he kind of gets more of a low ball deal because he's still not totally made up for that shitty season in uh, Toronto. I think, uh, yeah, I'm not going to speculate on the Ovi thing. I, I think Max, right? You guys, I can't really see him leaving, but Nuge, that's an interesting one. I feel it like is. that's a guy. That's a guy who could probably get some decent dough, um, but Edmonton at the same time cannot afford to lose him. He's that perfect second line center, great two way game. Uh, depth has always been an issue for Edmonton. So I feel like they can't let him go, but I also feel like he kind of has him by the balls. So uh, yeah, we'll see about that. The big one for me, and this is probably Leafs bias, that Zach Hyman contract is is very interesting. The best comparison that I could give, and this is, uh, this is just based on my watching experience, he's that sandpaper, like grit in your face, will beat the shit out of you, kills penalties, can play the power play, is scoring a lot of goals this season. He's like a prime Chris Kunitz kind of, like that honey badger but can score kind of guy. And if you took Chris Kunitz in his prime when he put up like almost 70 points in a season when he was playing with Sid, God knows what he would have gotten paid. So I think Hyman's going to back the truck up and take the bank. And I don't think Toronto's in a position where they're going to be able to afford him. No, I completely agree. I look at him like a second line maybe even a first line kind of like Jay Beagle. Like, and you say that like honey badger type, you know, go into the corner, get the puck, feed it out to Matthews, 
you know, one and done. It's in the back of the net. I think you make a great point there that, you know, with him being probably their most important person to re-sign on that forward free agent list, I think you can look at the other Leafs forwards on that list, like Joe Thornton and Nick Foligno. Mm -hmm. I don't, I just don't see a way that they can keep those guys. I think you can pretty much write them off as not coming back now. Yeah. Unless there's like some league minimum thing they work out, but uh, Hyman has been arguably their most important glue piece this season. So that's one that you got to watch. And I think, you know, the goaltending list that you just uh, gave is pretty interesting. Again, Leafs by is Freddie Anderson. What's going to happen? Cause you know, Campbell soup has come in. He's kind of made some noise. Anderson's had some great numbers in the regular season falling apart in the playoffs. I can't wait to see what the Leafs do in the playoffs this season. It's going to be just pure bliss when we yes. see something go wrong or go right. And then everybody throws their hands up and it's like a, a divided, uh, divided fan base. And then as far as defensemen, that ducky Hamilton, uh, I know you guys have kind of pooped on him a little bit about, you know, his little uh, incident with Ovi or lack thereof, because he was a little scaredy cat in the playoffs two years ago. But I mean, this guy has the longest point streak among defensemen in the league so far this season. He's done nothing but produce since he got to Carolina Carolina's got arguably the best defensive core in the league. And this is Dougie's second team in what, like three seasons. So um, I could see his name getting moved. And I think there'd be a very lucky team who could get him. Yeah. I mean, we, we poke fun out of him all the time. You got to for something like that, but all, all jokes aside, I mean, he's a hell of a player and I think he's grown a lot in the last two years since all that happened too. So it, yeah. yeah, no, no doubt that he's going to be, or whoever gets him is going to be lucky to have him. I think the Canes might re-sign him. I, I just see like I just see them going after him as opposed to, you know, maybe one of their other defensemen who comes up who's not as right. as high up on that list. And I think the Alec Martinez one too is important. He's been so good yeah. for Vegas all year. Um, he's just been consistent. And I think that's one thing that Vegas didn't have early on was defensive consistency. And he's, you know, he's not making like a ton of you know, he's not as flashy as Dougie Hamilton. He doesn't have that point streak going, but I think for a team like that, having that stability on the back end is, it's just priceless. Well, I think with those three defensemen that you just named, that's interesting. I would say all three of them are probably the second best defensemen on the team that they play on. So yes. you kind of have to compare what the main guys are making Petrangelo, Slavin and Darnell nurse yeah. and compare it to what these three guys are going to do. So uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll see that Hyman one though. I, I'm, I'm That's big the big on that. one. Yeah, for me, that's the big one because yeah. Toronto, need I say anymore. Right. Can't wait for Rick to uh, eventually come on the show. That'll yep, be it'll be good to get Rick back on. Yeah, he'll give us the lowdown. So that covers it for the free agency update. That should add a ton more drama to what's already going to be a drama-filled offseason with the draft and then the expansion draft. Uh, we wanted to give you a quick fantasy hockey update. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, Honey Nut Chelios is going dancing. Uh, we are going to try and put a boat on the water here. Uh, I know Curtin's going to put up a good fight. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. And Mac, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Mr. Commissioner, the final round is three weeks long instead of two weeks. Is it? I'm not sure about that one. I'll, I'll double check that for okay. you. Um, I was just going to say, yeah, I mean, congrats to you and congrats to Matt Curtin and also congrats to the other two finalists, yes. uh, Sean Wertheim. And my sister, Cass Vogel, both of those teams were also absolute wagons all year long and tough to play against every year or every week rather. So yeah. Um, shout out to all four of you and may the best man win. It sucks that uh, whoever comes in second place gets uh, absolutely fucking nothing. So yeah, that's, that's um, how life is. So it's a good learning moment. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. If you ain't first, you're last all or nothing. Right. It's like 250 bucks or whatever the hell, but exactly. Yeah. Good luck. Looking forward to it should be fun. I'm, I'm sure we'll get, uh, you know, if, if Curtin wins, we can have him come on and he can, set, you know, say his spiel and everything. And for sure. Yeah, that'll be entertaining. Uh, I also just want to touch on the roller hockey debut for the empty betters. Uh, first game was last week was a tough one. Um, I'm going to be honest with you guys. Have you ever skated on an indoor roller rink? Yeah. My so, buddy was telling me about how the it was yeah. it was like way different feeling than than he the way he said it was like um, trying to put rollerblades on like an ice rink or something yes. like that. Yes, that's exactly how I felt, dude. I've I've always played outside for roller, and you know you're playing on tennis courts or like 
you know, mm-hmm. actual ranks that are paved cement, like, yeah, real, like yeah. real flat. And it's very, gr- you can grip the wheels very easily. It's not yeah. slippery. It's, it's dry. Right. And when I got onto this rink, it was like someone like sprayed like an epoxy coating on top of the cement. Yep. And it, it was just slippery. It was it, like when you, you know how like you snap your toe at the end of a stride, it wouldn't snap because it would just slide. And I was like, what the hell? It felt, it truly felt like I was learning how to skate again and I couldn't stop. Um, I felt like a bender. It was pretty bad. <laughs> but to be honest, like the other team we played, we have, I think, like 12, 13 guys on our roster. We were changing lines, buzzing all over the place. I was like, they have six players on their team. Like, we're oh, going to kill shit. these guys. No, we didn't. They knew what they were doing. And they all, like, when they were stopping, you could hear the wheels, like, fucking, like, grind into it. And I was like, God, how do you do that? Yeah. They're, um, I'm sure they were using those, like, super grippy, soft like, soft wheels, which I know that were typically a little bit more on the harder spectrum. Uh, I know with your blades you are, and I know with mine I'm the same way. Just because yeah. we're used to the the whole tennis court thing, so right. Uh, so I'm gonna have to fix that, I guess. But uh, we yeah. got spanked like nine four, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, had a couple good chances, but uh, best looking well. team out there, though, right? Hell yeah! Oh, the there jerseys looked fucking fresh. So that was uh, that was a good one. So yeah, zero uh, and one to start the year. Unfortunately, will not be at the game uh, tomorrow, April twenty eighth. I'm not going to reveal why, but I think you guys will understand when we uh, have next week episode come out. So uh, be on the lookout for that. I won't have any spoiler details, but yeah. Yeah. And I'll, uh, I'll give a quick update. I'm going to be playing in my first ice beer league game in Milwaukee this coming weekend. Um, I'm not sure if it's Friday or Saturday because my team captain told me that our first game was on April 31st. Uh, and there are only 30 games or 30 days in April. So I have no idea if he meant the 30th or the first, but uh, I'm working on figuring that out before this weekend. So I actually know when I'm supposed to show up to the rink. But, That's fucking great. Yeah. Other than That's that, awesome. only updates are uh, we're still called team pinnacle, but I think we were gray. Now when I, when I left uh, we were wearing orange unmarked, just orange jerseys with nothing on the front of them. Uh, but it sounds like we may have transitioned to gray and I don't know if we have a logo or anything, but I'll, I'll keep y'all updated on whatever else Could go with team gray goose. Yeah. (laughs) I also have, you want to keep the vodka thing going. I also haven't been on the ice in like longer than I would like to admit on this podcast. So we'll see how, how bad I am this weekend. But I joined, I joined a adult league too. And I, I haven't skated in two years, maybe two and a half. Yeah. Wow. So yeah um keep you all updated we appreciate everybody for listening if you haven't checked us out on uh twitter go do that at empty betters same thing with instagram uh check out our website www.emptybetters.com check out our merchandise uh we're very excited to be working with wilson print shop for our merchandise uh supplier they do a great job we got some new under armor stuff up on there so go take a look and uh you guys got any final notes no no Caps play the Pens Thursday and they Saturday. Do. Should yep. be a good series. Yep. Um, best of luck to you guys. One last Pen stat because it came to my brain. We're the only line in hockey. Russ Gensel and Sid uh, all have 20 goals. So best line in hockey, no debate. If you want to come at me, go for it. Um, all righty. I, I think that's it. So I got my cut my piece out. There you we'll go. talk. Yeah. We'll talk to you all later. That'll do it for uh, episode 73. And without further ado, class dismissed. <laughs>